Well, good evening or afternoon, <laughs> everyone. Um, it's lovely to be with you again this afternoon. The angels, God's messengers, and it's a subject maybe we don't hear about too much, although the angels are all the way through the word of God. We're going to look at the work of the angels this afternoon, and we're going to understand what angels do and what they actually mean and what they say and how God works with them. So first of all, we need to look at the angels and can we now see that? Yes. All right. So angels, God's messengers. So you have to look at the angels meaning. What does the word angels mean? Well, they're God's messengers, which is the subject of our title. They dispatch a, me a message that is sent to a destination for a purpose. God tells them to give a message. Um, they are ambassadors, representatives. Now, if you go into London, you'll see the Russian embassy, see the Israeli embassy, the Ugandan embassy, whatever embassies they are. And each person within their own embassies will be ambassadors and represent their country and what their country wishes for them to speak and to say. And that's the idea with angels. Angels are ambassadors of God. They're representing him and they bring tidings and news and they actually also do various activities for him, which we shall see shortly. So come with me to Hebrews and chapter one, and we we'll see about the meaning of angels. We said they're messengers, but we're given a bit of more detail in Hebrews and chapter one. In Hebrews chapter one, verse 14, we're going to take a couple of verses from this chapter. Verse 13 for connection to, but to which of the angels said he at any time. So here's God speaking about well, the Lord Jesus, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. No angels have been told that. That's for the Lord Jesus. But the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them which are heirs of salvation? So they are ministering spirits. They support and help those who are heirs of salvation. So in our belief in sincerity, we're the heirs of salvation. We are believe and are baptized and are their heirs according to the promise. Then the angels work for us collectively and individually. And that's a remarkable thing to say and to think about. When I did this talk once on a, on a Zoom class and there were 30 squares, I said, well, actually, there's 60 in this room. <laughs> You think about that, the angels working with us, the angels are present with us. And so it makes us think in our lives that God is watching us and the angels are present. Does it make us think what we might be doing in our lives? Because we are seen. Hebrews chapter one, verse seven. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh these angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So they're spiritual beings and they're immortal. God created them, but they are immortal and flame of fire, which also speaks of judgment. And we see how the angels are involved with judgment a little later. So let's go to our reading. We talked about messages, didn't we? There are many examples that we could talk about, but I'm just going to pick a few. Genesis chapter 18. So here we have Abraham and Sarah. Chapter 17, they were promised a son that they would call Isaac. Can you see that? Genesis 17, verse 19. And God said to Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. He is the one that is going to be of the chosen line, the everlasting covenant. So something had to happen. This was a miracle, by the way, because... Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 when they were going to, she was going to give birth, Sarah, to um, Isaac. 
just as an aside, as the angel says in chapter 18, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? I would put forward that the Lord did a reverse aging process on Abraham and Sarah, which allowed Sarah to have a child. Because God is in control of all things. And if he wants something to happen, whatever will happen, he wants it to happen, it will do. So here we have, but interestingly enough, we notice in verse one and two that there's Abraham looking out and he saw three men. There were three men and they came with a message in verse nine. And they said unto Abraham, where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, she's in the tent and I will certainly return. This is the message of the Lord to them. Time alive. In other words, Sarah will have she will conceive and have a child. Sarah actually laughed at this. And that's why the angel said, is anything too hard for the Lord? And notice in verse 16, and the men, the men themselves rose up thence. And then we went into verse 22, and the men turned their ways to Sodom, after Sodom, the city of Sodom, after they'd given this message. But when we come to verse 19, chapter 19, and one of the angels or one of the men has gone, we notice, and there came two angels. So the angels look like men. I think that's important to say, by the way, scripture does not teach like you might see at nativity plays or on stamps sometimes or whatever. They do not have wings. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches they look like men. So Abraham saw, because if he'd seen something that, <laughs> coming with wings, I think he would have pretty much known that, realized something else. He just welcomed the men because they had come and he thought they were men coming on a journey. Well, they were. They were sent by God. And they were angels. So angels look like us. But of course, they're not like us in a sense. They're immortal as we're mortal at this particular time. So they look like men, but God has one name and many titles, which explains what he is doing at any particular one time. And I want us to, to look here at Genesis chapter one. I was in the Wolverhampton town centre recently, and, and one of another church was preaching, and he came to me, and I he was quite... Uh, vocal and i challenged him straight away because i knew what was coming so i got in there first and said well i believe in god but do you believe in the trinity he said yes and i said how could you <laughs> i said how can you believe in three gods that's idolatry how can you believe that jesus died jesus was god and god died that's blasphemous i really actually made it very plain and the verse he tried to use to me is a verse that many of them will try and say, verse 27. Uh, so God created man in his image, and the image created male and female. Okay, but we read there in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. And the argument is, oh, the us must be God and the Lord Jesus being God. Well, it doesn't say that, does it? The word Elohim, God here, clearly talking about us, is actually the mighty host of angels. And they're made, man is made in the image of God that we think, that we can understand, that we can have knowledge, but also an image. And so the angels are like men and we're like that our appearance is like an angel in the sense of we don't shine like an angel does and we come back to this idea of shining in a minute but and we're not immortal yet but you can see the connection there let us make man in our own image and so it's the mighty ones god working through his angels in creation and so we are made looking like angels in that sense. As the angels came to Abraham and they look like men. And there's many examples that we can give, a, give in that regard. We're not immortal yet. We are mortal. But these angels have the power of God given to them at this now. They exist. 
So, moving on. The angels bring deliverance. So we have a message, but they are active, active in the things of God. So when they came to Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah was a city that anything went, basically. And things happened there that was not pleading, pleasing to God. And Abraham, he had a nephew called Lot. Lot had a wife there and his two daughters. And they were in this city. And we notice in verse 1 of chapter 19, which we looked at, two angels came to Sodom, this particular place. And they had a message. And in verse 12 and 13, they came to Lot, these angels, and the men said, notice the word men, it goes, falls back into the word men, said unto Lot, hast thou here any besides son-in-law to daughters or son-in-laws uh, and thy sons and thy daughters? In other words, other family members come because in verse 13, the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. So the angels will come to bring judgment because in the city there was hardly any faith. In fact, it was Lot, really. His two daughters went with him. Lot's wife turned back. Of course, we know she turned into a pillar of salt. But the idea is the city was full of evil and God's judgment to come. And so it did come with fire and brimstone. Just as an aside, I heard a talk recently by a brother from South Africa who showed great evidence to this. And just after that, um, in Israel, they found similar evidence that uh, it was probably a meteorite explosion right above the city that flattened it. All the hallmarks of that was there. And the idea was whatever we think, it was at the right place at the right time, at the right moment, as God would say. Just an interesting aside. But certainly the city was destroyed and its surrounding cities. And they had to escape. And in fact, the angels in verse 16, because Lot and his family, they, they loitered, they lingered. They laid them upon their, their hands upon them and brought them out quickly. Escape for your life, they said in verse 17. And, and so Lot went. So the angels came to bring news of a judgment and they were involved in that judgment and they came to bring deliverance as well so that those were not consumed so there's an example of the work of the angels very active and i notice a flame of fire we, we mentioned that in hebrews that god gives them the power in terms of judgment as well as we shall see further a little later god guides as well and there was a period when a time when Abraham, his son Isaac, had grown up a bit. And uh, Abraham sadly lost his wife, Sarah, who died at 127 years old. And Isaac was feeling lonely because of his mother. Abraham knew that they had to continue the family line so needed a wife for Isaac. So he said to his servant, Eliezer, go thou, in chapter 24, to my country and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. But notice this in verse 7. And the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son. And that angel <coughs> protected them, the servant, because it would have been a camel train full of wedding dowry, wouldn't it? To pay the family to bring Rebecca. And on the way back as well, bringing Rebecca. And they were being a countryside where they were traveling hundreds of miles north. And they would have had to be protected on the way as well. So the angel was a guide to them and a protector as well from harm. And to bring them to the place that God had chosen for the servant to find a wife 
for Isaac. We read from verse 16, 15 onwards about Rebecca, who was the chosen one and how she watered the camels. It was Rebecca of the family from Abraham, one, one of his brothers, one of his relatives, that they actually came to and found the wife, guided by the angel that God had sent. So the angel was fulfilling God's purpose by guiding the servant on his way. And in verse 40, when the servant recited to the family what had happened to Rebecca's family, and he said unto me, the Lord, this is Abraham, before whom I walk, will send his angel with thee and prosper thee in the way. So the work of the angels can they be a guide and a protector in this, that God's purpose will be full. God sent that angel for this purpose. And as I said, they're protectors as well. So protected that family, that, that camel train and coming back as well. But here's a mighty example of protecting. Let's look at Exodus chapter 14. And we have here the Egyptians had basically cornered the children of Israel by the Red Sea. Children of Israel, of course, had left under the hand of Moses out of Egypt. Pharaoh, whose heart was hardened, changed his mind and raced after them. And the children of Israel were by the Red Sea and it looked like they were cut off and the people were in shock. So they thought, well, this is the end. We've been brought out only to die by the shores of the Red Sea. But that was not God's plan and purpose. We read in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 19, because God had caused a, a pillar of cloud during the day and, and it would be fire at night. So it could shine as light to those all around. And in verse 19, and the angel of the Lord, which went before the camp. So the angel of the Lord was sent by God to lead the camp, <clears throat> to lead them in the way went before the camp of Israel and removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud, which went from before their face, stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light to night to these, so that the one came not near the other all night. So we know then the children of Israel, by that miracle, crossed the Red Sea when it was parted. But that cloud kept the Egyptians at bay. And it was the angel that went before them that removed that cloud. He uh, came as a protector. God gave him that authority to do so. So angels protect those who are the heir of salvation also. Think about situations in your own lives. And we've got to be... You know, if we believe God's working with us and sending the angels, we can probably reflect upon things that have happened whereby if we had been in the wrong place at the wrong time, we would have been harmed. Little personal story. I was going to the bank one day and I went to the cash machine and it was smashed, but I could just about see the numbers to press and I pressed the numbers and I cut my finger foolishly. I thought foolishly at the time. And I didn't have a handkerchief with me, but so it caused me to go back to my car rather than go to the shop that I was going to to get some one or two things. I went back to my car and a car, suddenly an older person lost control and went straight onto the pavement where I would have been if I hadn't have cut my finger and gone back to the car. Now, it's little things like that. Not little things, big things, but things like that can happen in our lives. I think we shouldn't ever be to worry about sharing these things because we give glory to God. But certain things, things can happen in our lives. And so if the angels are ministers and to the heirs of salvation, they protect us as well. So these things are for us to think about. An angel, God's name in him, God, they, they are ambassadors for God. They, they represent him, so they bear his name. They speak of him and all that God wishes and his plan and his purpose. 
So when they're in the wilderness, for example, let's look at Exodus chapter 23. We're staying in Exodus for the moment. When we go to verses 20 to 23, we know that the angel was with them because of the mupilla that the angel moved to protect them. We now see that God's name is in the angel. And he speaks God's words and is given God's authority. Verse 20, behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. So the angel had a purpose. Beware of him. God has given him authority and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression. So the angel has authority to bring judgment if necessary. For my name is in him. God's name, Yahweh, I will be who I will be. God is there with the angel and the angel is representing. And so the angel actually goes on to say that he will be an adversary or Satan to his Satans. In other words, adversary to Maya, thine adversaries. And the angel is there protecting them and will save them if where necessary from those of their enemies. In Exodus chapter 3, we see as well this shown very carefully. We call it the passage of the bush that burned but did not, uh, you know, it was on fire, but it did not burn, did it? But it was on fire. You could see this particular bush. And we read in Exodus chapter 3 and going at verse 2 clearly that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And the Lord, in verse 4, saw that when, when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called to him. But we know it's the angel that spoke, because it was the angel that was in the bush. We know that from verse 2. And so this continues this dialogue. And verse 11, Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh? No man could look upon God and live. We know that from Scripture. But he could look upon an angel who spoke God's words because God's name was in the angel. Verse 15, and God said unto Moses, this is my name for ever. And this is my memorial to all generations. But we know from verse two is clearly the angel spoke to him. We what we call God manifestation. Interestingly enough, if this particular passage, just imagine it's not, I know, I'm just giving an example. This particular passage were in the New Testament and it applied to Jesus. Trinitarians would use this as saying that Jesus is God. I've never actually heard a Trinitarian say, oh, if the angel is there and then he's called angel and then God later, he must be God as well. Is there a quadratarian, a quinitarian? How many tarians do you want? It's not. It is a principle of God manifestation. How the angel spoke God's words. He represented God in this particular situation as Jesus did the same as the son of god i just mentioned that as a very good proof bible um, meaning and understanding so moving on how mighty is an angel well we talk about angels bringing judgment and we talked about angels there would go the angel would go forth in the wilderness and protect them from their enemies well, look at this for an example in Isaiah chapter 27. This is a very powerful and sobering thought. The power that an angel can yield. The Assyrian army had surrounded Jerusalem in the time of Hezekiah. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Isaiah the prophet was with him. Hezekiah showed faith and we know of the faith of Isaiah. So when we come to verse 33 of Isaiah 37, therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, this king of Assyria, Sennacherib and his hordes who had come to Jerusalem to take it with their various shields and their various munitions. The Lord says, by the way that he came, the same shall he return, for I will defend this city. That's what the Lord says. And how did he do that? Then the angel of the Lord, a particular angel, whether it was an archangel like Michael or Gabriel, we're not told, but it was a mighty angel. 
oh, angels are mighty, to be honest. But here we have a particular angel of the Lord was went forth and smote the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000 of them in one night. Think about that. Think about the time of the northern host coming into the land of Israel and the judgments are to come and the angels will be part of that, I believe, as well, because we read the words of Jesus that he will send forth his angels to cast out those who offend in his kingdom, to cast them into a lake of fire. So the angels are mighty and they can do that. One angel is the 185,000 men. So that's something to consider moving into the new testament we had the announcement of the birth of isaac that was given by the angels in genesis 18 we're now coming to the greatest birth of all the birth of the lord jesus christ luke chapter one we know this particular passage very well i'm sure but it's good to always look into these things Luke chapter 1 and, and verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, the name is identified there. The angel Gabriel, that is God is my strength. That's the meaning of the word Gabriel. So very appropriate. The name bears the purpose of God, doesn't it? God is my strength. Was sent from God. God sent this angel to Galilee, to Nazareth, to a virgin. And so when we read in verse 26 onwards, we read about the message about him, the angel appearing to Mary. Hail, verse 28, thou art highly favoured, Mary. Verse 30, fear not, Mary, and you will have a son, verse 31, and his name shall be called Jesus, Yeshua, in the Hebrew, the name of the Messiah. And what will happen? He shall be great, shall be called the son of the highest. The, th the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. What a wonderful message. Here's the Messiah. This is what's been promised. Remember the promises like in Second Samuel 7. Mary would have known these. Now she realized that she was the virgin who was talked about in Isaiah. And quite understandably, she wondered how this could be, as she knew not a man. And the angel said to how the Holy Spirit would come, the power of God would come upon her. And she would conceive and bear the Son of God. And so that was the message of the angels. And in fact, more angels appeared. We've, we've got in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 14, when the shepherds who were faithful came to the place, to see the child, they were abiding in their uh, fields, keeping watch over their sheep. And an angel appeared to them to give them the wonderful message, this wonderful, that the Messiah had come. What a wonderful message, the greatest birth of all. And the angel of verse 10 says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. So it is for Jew and Gentile. A wonderful declaration that was according to the promise of God. And that in, in Bethlehem, in a manger, swaddling clothes, you shall see this child. And it was so wonderful, <coughs> so great, that lots of angels appeared. And suddenly, verse 13, there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest on an earth, peace, goodwill toward men. This is what it was all building up to. The Messiah, the promised one who would reveal God. And the angels rejoiced. So they gave the message, the wonderful message, but they rejoiced as well. And we talk about a baptism, isn't it, as well, that when somebody is baptised, that the angels are rejoicing at one who has come and repented. So we move forward to the end of the gospel, to the wonderful and moving situation here, where the angel came to give news. But there was something incredible that an angel had to do first. 
And that's in Luke 22, verses 41 to 43. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a real trial for him. We even read that he was in such an agony that in verse 44, his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, I know that can be a condition under great stress. You think about that. I think about it. Do you know what happened in verse 30, 43? God sent an angel unto Jesus, strengthening him. So the angel comforted Jesus, was a strength to him in his time of need. Think of what that angel was doing and what it meant to that angel to comfort the Son of God at his very hour of need of what he went then to do for us. And then in chapter 24, verses 4 to 6, we have the message that Jesus is risen from the dead. They came on the first day of the week, didn't they? In verse 1, to the sepulchre. Didn't expect this, did they? As it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, there stood two men, stood by them in shining garments. I said we will get to shining. Here's a witness. We've had men appearing, but angels can appear in shining garments because in this particular case, it was a very important event. The raising of the dead of the son of god there was no doubt they were shining with this glorious news and no wonder that they were afraid and bowed their faces to the ground i would do the same i saw two figures standing with shining garments and giving that message it is a, a natural reaction but also a reaction of those of faith recognizing the ways of God. What a wonderful message from the birth and to the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the angel's message did not stop there. It is applicable to us, not just because of the great salvation that has been wrought through the Lord Jesus Christ, but in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, when Jesus had appeared to his disciples and been with them for 40 days and was going to be taken up to the heaven and he departed in verse 10, they looked up to heaven when he went, who appeared? Maybe it was the same two angels that had appeared at the sepulcher, perhaps. Behold, two men stood them in white apparel. So white shows pureness. It shows glory, doesn't it? And which said this wonderful message, which is for us, us in these last days, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So the message at the resurrection is not the end. There's a promise of Jesus returning again. It's a fact that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. It's a fact that he will return again. And that's what we look for. And this is the message that God had sent the angels as ambassadors to speak to the disciples. He is coming again. We don't know the day or the hour, but as we live in the last days, we see plenty of signs that point towards that. He is coming and he will return again. So that makes us something to think about. And let's think of something here more so as well in our lives. Do we just think that the angels are compartmentalized in different periods of time? As I said before, if they are, and they are, ministering spirits for the heirs of salvation, they are working. We know with the signs of the times and what's happening in the nations that the angels are active among the nations. Why should they not be active among us, particularly as we read the words? They are ministers for the heirs of salvation. Come with me to Hebrews. And chapter 13, a passage that we know, I wonder how much we think about this. Sometimes you might think, oh, what does all this mean? Hebrews 13, verse one, let brotherly love continue. 
be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Here's hospitality that we should show. Now, if we believe that God is active, then we should believe that the angels are active for us. And some have entertained angels unawares. Well, certainly Abraham did, didn't he? But this is written for a, in the time that Paul wrote to the Hebrews in the first century. And it's true for us. <laughs> I smile because I've had a number of brothers and sisters come up to me and say, well, actually, I remember this and remember that. Or going down the road and thinking something and somebody, somebody looking at you. I wonder who that person is. Any of story like that. It's nothing to be, you know, I keep my, my feet on the ground. I might be a Welshman and get emotional, but I do keep my feet on the ground about these things and these things will happen. We don't know we, what it teaches us. So we got to be careful whoever we speak to, because we don't know, do we? If you entertain angels and awares. We're not talking about um, in a white shining garment and a miracle like that happened, but angels can be there. And we never know who we're speaking to. So that's another thing for us to think about, isn't it? And do we have personal angels? Yes, I believe. I know there was a, I think the audience is Christadelphian. <laughs> we have the Christadelphian magazine. There was a debate some time ago. I think it was through the letters or whatever page. Where, you know, Do we have personal angels? I don't think there's any doubt about that. If we turn to Matthew and chapter 18. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus has got young children with him around about. And some are rebuking the disciples, you know, Jesus saying, lest you become like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. He was using little children that are around him as examples of trust in their parents. And so we should have trust in God. And... Uh, when we come to verse four, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And when we come to verse 10, take he, says Jesus, that he despise not of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven, their angels. So, yes, there is personal angels, I believe, who are working for those. And even though it's a little child who might not come to full all knowledge, knowing, say, that, that they would come to full knowledge, the angel will protect them through their life to that and onwards. So here we have this teaching for us. It's something we shouldn't be concerned about. We should embrace it and realize God is working in our lives. Matthew 24 as we're still in Matthew, verses 30 to 31, his work of angels again. We talk about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. They will be very active. And we read in verse 31 of Matthew 24, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see Jesus, the Son of Man, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send forth his angels with a great cloud of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So the angels are involved in gathering those who are elect. I remember, and I, I, I say this lovingly because the brother involved who's no longer, he's fallen on sleep. He was of a nervous disposition and he told me once, he said, I know the angels are to come and it does make me sweat. And I put a lock on my door and I said, well, that'll make no difference at all. <laughs> He's a lovely brother. So I wasn't, uh, you know, I was quite sincere to him. But, you know, the, the, an angel, we know that with Peter, didn't he? Uh, slapped him on the side, woke up and the, and, and the gate of the city and the prison uh, gate also opened. When they come, they will come. And so God has a work for them and the Lord Jesus will send out the angels to do his work. So all these things are for us and that's a future event. So we've had all about the angels, about being protectors and guides, that they bring judgment, that they watch over, 
the heirs of salvation, that they have brought messages like for Isaac's birth and the greatest birth of the Lord Jesus and his resurrection and the great message that Jesus is soon to come and that they will be active at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as they are active for us individually now as heirs of salvation. So I just want to think about that. Let, let's remember all this and the teaching about the angels and finish with this first because it is very comforting for us all in Psalm 34 verse 7 that the angel of the Lord encamps or surround and guards round about them that fear him and deliver him. Do we believe that? That is God's promise for us. So let us think about these things, be encouraged by them, be humbled by this, and I'll remember our calling before God. And that his work for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and also through his angels.